Good morning. Good morning. You all, for those of you that are here this morning, if you'll come in and stand with us.
worshiping with us at home on page 77 in your Book of Common Prayer. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, kneeling as we are able. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. Standing as we are able this morning. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. We now skip to verse 19. You spoke once in a vision and said to your faithful people, I have set the crown upon a warrior and an exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. My hand will hold him fast, and my arm will make him strong. No enemy shall deceive him, nor any wicked man bring him down. I will crush his foes before him, and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and love shall be with him, and he shall be victorious through my name. I shall make his dominion extend from the great sea to the river. He will say to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated.
second lesson is found on page 126 in the Key Bibles. A lesson from Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, beginning at the 25th verse of the 16th chapter. Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. Now to God who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed and through the prophetic writing is made known to all the Gentiles according to the command of eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Thus ended the lesson. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Did you ever have a dream vacation? I don't mean your normal vacations out to the shore or up to the mountains. I mean that one vacation that you've been planning in your mind for years and years and years. Anybody have a vacation like that? Okay, I see some heads nodding yes. I see a few vacant stairs. It's still early. <laughs> Did that dream vacation go exactly as you had planned? I hear some no's. I hear some. I see some shrugs. I see some sort of kind of's, and I see a few smiles. Right? Usually, our dream vacations run into hiccups, just like our regular vacations do. Right? We've all been down to the shore, and all it does all week is what? Rain, right? Much less when you finally are able to go to Iceland or England or wherever you've always wanted to go and you get there. I'll, I'll let you in a little secret. If you go to England, it's going to rain a lot. <laughs> but maybe for those who don't have a, a, vaca a dream vacation they've done, for those who are retired, did you dream about retirement before you got there? Did you have plans? Yes. Did you have an idea as to what your retirement would be like? Was your retirement actually like that? I see mostly head shakings no here. Hold on to that for just a minute. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him. Now the king he's talking about here is David, the second king of Israel. And here he's at the top of his power. God's people are protected. All of the items that have been taken from them over the years, most importantly the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark made by Moses and Aaron, all of them have been returned to God's people. And now they're all in Jerusalem. The people are unified under David's leadership. And they go into a time of peace. And David moves into his palace in Jerusalem. And David now wants to build God a house better than the one he lives in. How does he describe the tabernacle? He says, God's living in a tent, and I'm in a palace made out of cedar. He seems to be feeling a little guilty here, that he's in a beautiful palace. And the place of worship is the tabernacle, a tent that had first been built way back in Moses and Aaron's time. And notice, the prophet Nathan here doesn't stop and pray. He just says, hey, you know what, David? That sounds like a good idea. Probably the same advice. Most of what? Most of us would just give off the top of our heads, right? It's a common sense answer. You want to build God a new house, go for it. But that night, God comes back to Nathan and says, Listen, you all are misunderstanding what I want. God explains to them, He's not had a house, a permanent dwelling place by design. He tells Nathan, I've never asked for a permanent dwelling place. I didn't ask Moses, I didn't ask Joshua, I didn't ask any of the other judges. Now in some ways I think God has not wanted his people to think that he's only in one place. That he's limited. That he's like the gods of all the peoples around them. Most of the gods of the peoples around them had exactly one place you could go and talk to them. There was an emergency, you had to hightail it there. The temple of those gods were like police boxes on the side of the road. You get to connect to one number, and only while the phone is in your hand, and that's it. And if you're in real trouble, no one may be there to answer when you need it. And listen, many of the gods were beings you did not actually want to meet out on the road someday. Think about the stories you heard in school about Zeus. Does Zeus sound like the kind of person you want to bump into in the middle of the night? Does it ever turn out well for the mortals involved in that story? Instead, God, the I am, God says, I'm everywhere. My tabernacle moves with my people. And when they came into the promised land, the tabernacle moved around so it was in different parts. So they could all come and worship in different places. He was and is everywhere so that we can all pray anywhere. We can talk to him like he's our father, our friend. And Joe, yes, God says, I want to save everyone. 
And then God tells Nathan, Therefore you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be a prince over my people Israel. Now God spends time reminding David of his journey. David wasn't born in the palace. That God had brought him from being a shepherd of sheep to being the shepherd of his people. But he makes David a promise. He tells Nathan this. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom will be made sure forever before me, and your throne established forever. David wanted to build God a house, somewhere better than even David was living in. God, in return, wants to fulfill his promise to Abraham. He wants to build a family of God. He says, David, your dynasty, your children will reign forever. Think about that as a promise. God loved his people and promised them a Messiah. And God loved David and promised the Messiah would come from his family. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. From age to age my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persuaded that your love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. This was written by Ethan the Ezraite. And Ethan was a minister of music under David. And I imagine that David's understanding of God is shining through here. That the love that Ethan is writing about is the same God and the same love that David writes when he writes, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then Ethan talks about what God has promised to David, that he'll establish your line forever and make your throne firm throughout all the generations. And Ethan goes on to talk about how David was anointed by God, the God who created the heavens and the earth. And that because of that relationship, God would bless him and his descendants. That the love of God would allow us all to say, You are my Father, my God, the rock of my salvation. In our gospel we read, In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in that Galilee called Nazareth. Now the last two weeks, We've heard from the evangelists Mark and John. They both begin their declarations of who Jesus is, right? Mark says he's the Christ, the Messiah. John says he's the Word made flesh. And they start with him about to be baptized by his cousin John on the River Jordan. Luke begins his gospel with the angel first coming to Zechariah and Elizabeth, telling them that they're about to have a son. But like Abraham and Sarah, even though they've been trying for years, and even though they've not been able to have children, God was going to answer their prayer. And then six months later, the angel comes to Mary and tells her that she's going to have a child. And Mary's initially confused. She's scared a little bit, I think, by what the angel's telling her here. He has to reassure her, do not be afraid, Mary, if you have found favor with God. And now you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son in the name of Jesus. He'll be great and called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He'll reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Gabriel's telling Mary that what God had promised to David a thousand years before, what Ethan wrote about in his psalms, and what we've heard the prophets promise over the generations, those, all those different verses we've heard over the last six or eight weeks, that the Messiah was about to be born. And when Mary asks a very pr practical question, how? Gabriel says, don't worry. The Holy Spirit will take care of it. And therefore the child to be born will be holy. He'll be called the Son of God. And he tells her, listen, your cousin Elizabeth is also miraculously pregnant. For nothing, nothing is impossible with God. And all Mary can say in the moment is, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. In the moment, all she can do is be obedient to what God asks. Though a few weeks later, when she's being sent to be with Elizabeth, she tells Elizabeth this, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his holy servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm, scattered the crowd in their conceit. 
cast down the mighty from their thrones, and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he remembered his promise of mercy, the promise that he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. That through the son that she was about to bear, Mary says, listen, everything promised to Abraham and Sarah, to Isaac and Rebekah, to Jacob, to David, everything the prophets had spoken about would come to pass, and that God's love would become incarnate in this broken world. And through him, our broken world would start to be healed. Paul writes, Now to God who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret, for many long ages. Paul's epistle to the Romans is arguably his most thorough discussion of what God has been doing throughout all times and throughout all places. And he ends here with the doxology. He's crying out to God, thanking him for everything that he's done. Notice that Paul says that God is strengthening us through the gospel, through the proclamation of Jesus Christ. And that what was going to happen, what has happened, is not something new was not plan B, it was not a last minute script change. No, the plan of God had been in place, but, had been, but was being kept secret. But then Paul says this, but now it's disclosed, and through the prophetic's writing, he's made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith. But now God's mystery revealed has still been revealed, in part. Jesus has come with redemption and freedom, healing and love, and that plan had only been seen in glimpses until he came. This dream of the Messiah did not happen the way that most of them thought it would happen. The Messiah came not to liberate them physically, but to liberate them spiritually, to free them from sin and death, to free them to love God and to love their neighbor. And now, even we who've been grafted into the vine can begin to understand what God had been revealing to the prophets. Why? Because he's unveiled it to us in our hearts. Through faith. And it's that faith that brings us to see Jesus. And now we're waiting until the final unveiling of the mysteries, his return. Paul ends by saying, To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. And now today we're still waiting with that anticipation. And it's hard. David, Ethan, the prophets all waited with hope for what God was doing, but they still had to live in the world while they waited. And we know from reading scripture, it wasn't always easy. And while our wait to hear the Christmas story is almost over, in just a few hours you can come back and hear the Christmas story and take communion. But even with him revealed, we're still now waiting with hope for his return, praising God because in the end, death and the grave have been overcome. And because of that, we can wait with joy because of God's love. Amen.
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and hold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord. Lord, show us your love and mercy. We Lord, our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope. And we shall our hope in vain. Purify our conscience, Almighty God, by your daily visitation, that your Son, Jesus Christ, at his coming may find us in us a mansion prepared for himself, who lives and reigns with you, and you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Daniel, our bishop, and Jeremiah, our priest, and Emmanuel, bishop in Western Tanganyika, and Elias, bishop in Tabor, Tanzania, and all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for Joe, our president, and Josh, our governor, and for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Father, we pray for your compassion on Mark Sarienko and Brandon Newford, Jill Downing and Jim Downing, Jane Robbins and Kim Harrington, Jane Kennedy, Bob Rose, Hardy Carter, Corey Freeman, Donna Milster, Hazel Pankos, Bishop Sadek, Nicole Young, and the Reverend Dan Olson, Marie Stahl, Bill Donahue, David Del Grande, and Georgette Bruckendorf. And for all who suffer from any grief, or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Giving thanks for the life and memory of Henry Cadwallader, give to the departed of eternal rest. Let the light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray now for our own needs and those of others, either silently or aloud. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Praying together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all of whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. For the means of grace and for the hope of glory. 
And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies, that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your grace, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service, and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name, bring offering and come into his courts, that you may be seated.
poinsettias, we have uh, the, few, the few candles that need to be put up, we have probably 30 or 45 minutes worth of setup to do to be prepared for this evening. Because this evening at 4 o'clock we'll have our service, our family service with a family uh, sermon. And at 10 p.m., although really starting at about 9.40, we'll have our candlelight service. Uh, candlelight service starts at 9.40 with um, music for the season, and the service itself starts at 10. And then tomorrow morning we'll have uh, our Christmas Day service at 10 a.m. It'll be a quiet spoken service with Eucharist. All three will have Eucharist. Next weekend there will only be one service. There will be no uh, Saturday evening service, and no early Sunday service. There will be on the 31st, though, one service at 9.30 a.m. There will be Christmas lessons and carols. Mary, who jumped in this morning to help us when our, when our guest audience we had um, planned for, called late in the week and said he had COVID, Mary graciously jumped in so we have music this morning. Thank you, Mary. Mary will be back next Sunday along with Dana and Rebecca for lessons and carols in the choir. So it's going to be a lot of fun uh, singing and hearing God's word that day. And then by the following week, we will be back to our regular service schedule. The first weekend in January, we'll have Rector's Forum on the 7th and 14th, uh, and then take a couple weeks off and come back to the new Rector's Forum for a couple of weeks in February. Are there any other announcements that I have forgotten? Mary? You all stand with us.